on behalf of Princess Juliana International Airport, of course, I welcome you again. My name is Damien Schmidt. I'll be your MC, moderator, assistant, uh, tech assistant for the day. Uh, we'll begin uh, by helping me to welcome to the stage, uh, to, the, to the panel, actually, uh, Matt Lee, Regional Sales Manager for Tropical Aviation Distribu Distributors. Take a seat. Uh, Mr. Kelly Spaulding, Regional Sales Director for Textron Aviation. Then we have Mr. Bertrand Magras from right here in St. Bart's, Mr. Uh, from St. Bart's Commuter. And Mr. Rob Saravalo, there we go, from Tropic Ocean Airways, Fort Lauderdale. For the rest, I'll hand it over to Kelly. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. This is my first trip down. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to understand the region and, and uh, the happenings down here in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm the uh, regional sales director with uh, Textron Aviation, so I handle, uh, from the Caribbean side, all of the turboprop sales, so the uh, Caravan, the Cessna Denali, and uh, the King Air product line. Um, I've been in the role for about a year and a half now. I've been with the company about seven years or so. Domestically, I cover caravan sales uh, from eastern Canada, eastern U.S., and then obviously down through the Caribbean. Uh, they've uh, provided us with their own demo aircraft, so I've got an airplane available for demos, and I work with Tropical exclusively down here in the Caribbean. So I basically support uh, Tropical Aviation with their efforts and Matt's efforts to to sell the airplanes and, and help commuters and operators get a foothold down here in the Caribbean. Matt's been doing this a, doing this a very long time. Um, Matt, I'll let you just give a little bit of background on, on who you are and, and what you do for the company. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, again, I'm Matt Lee. I'm with uh, Tropical Aviation Distributors, and we are the uh, exclusive representative uh, for Textron Aviation, uh, Cessna and Beechcraft. Um, we are, like I said, the direct uh, communication between the customer and the factory. Um, we have uh, three to four salesmen in the region that travel pretty extensively and, uh, like I said, deal directly with the owners, operators uh, to keep the aircrafts, you know, flying. Um, our company has also um, been with Cessna for 49 years on the Africa side, so our uh, company has a very, very long uh, background with uh, Cessna as well as Textron Aviation. It's a good understanding because Matt spends a lot of the time in the territory. Um, I support him from the background on the factory side. I'm based in Tampa. I do get out in the territory, but when it does come to the, the travel piece, uh, putting the legwork in, building the relationships, and working in the territory, um, Matt's the guy. He travels extensively, um, so he's he's basically the, the face of, of uh, the factory, so uh, I support him in any way I can. Um, Rob, we've obviously had a great day with him yesterday, um, some great presentations and interaction. Uh, we really got to see how the Cessna Caravan is, can be applied down here in the Caribbean uh, to a very different level, uh, which I find interesting. Uh, Bertram, if you could explain and just give us a little bit of background on, on, on you and, and how your operation works down here in the Caribbean. Yeah, well, Sandbox Commuter was founded in 1995. We started operation in April. Um, the Caravan was in our mind since the beginning. Uh, even though we made the switch up only in 2009, that's when we took delivery of our first caravan. And by 2013, we had four of them. Uh, it's been a great addition to our operation. Uh, as of today, we accumulated about 11,000 hours, but that's, I think, uh, close to 50,000 landings and cycle because we do so much short trips. Um, and, I mean, I could sit there and list you a list of qualities of the caravan, but basically it comes down to three things, um, flexibility, uh, reliability, and low direct operating costs. And of course that's uh, good things for any AOC operation. So we're very pleased with that, with that product. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Rob, anything you want to add from, from yesterday, just from experience or anything you saw from yesterday, from your side? Yeah, no, I think... Um I got some words I can say about the caravan later when you're done, the reasons we selected it, if you prefer. Sure. 
Sure. Okay. So, good. Yeah, you guys heard me talk enough yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Uh, and I just wanted to give you some, you know, some overview. Um, we had some questions yesterday relating to Cessna and Beechcraft and, and how all that works and, and how that came together. Um, about two years ago, uh, we had, uh, on the Cessna side of the house, I was from the Cessna side, um, we had the thought process that uh, we were looking at the different OEMs out there in the marketplace, and, and Beechcraft was one of those OEMs that um, was having some challenges. So uh, Textron as a whole started looking at the opportunity to, to bring the two companies together. Um, so it's been about a 24-and-a-half-month process now, just a little over two-and-a-half years, um, where right now we're fully integrated. So we continue to build the King Air product line over at Beachfield, um, and all of our various products over at the Cessna side of the house. Um, they're still branded Cessna and Beechcraft. You know, we don't want to lose that branding of, of what the uh, history and lineage of the King Air is and, and the products that Beechcraft built. Um, so we're always going to make sure that those stay separate. Uh, but from a perspective of the company, it's, it's Textron Aviation out of Wichita, Kansas. So we've got the two, uh, the two factories. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we work on both airplanes there. We've got some new aircraft out that we've been working on um, that we'll go over here on the product uh, overview. I'll, I'll pull these up and, and just show you some of the airplanes that we're, that we're working on. Uh, we've also got a, uh, a CJ3 Plus on display that, that Matt brought down from Miami, so, or uh, actually up, I guess. Yeah, it's not down. We're, we're down. So, uh, so we'll have that airplane out at the airport today for, uh, for viewing and, and static display. So, um, so we're looking forward to it. Let me uh, see if I can pull this up here. So, you know, Cessna Caravan, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the venerable airplanes, you know, down here in the Caribbean and, and probably one of the most forefront. I know that, uh, you know, we have challenges and we're, we're working towards that with our panel referencing, um, you know, how they operate the airplane down here from a regulatory standpoint. Um, I think that the airplane has proven itself uh, over time in regards to safety, reliability of, uh, of what the aircraft does. Um, so I think that there's, you know, we're looking towards uh, hopefully seeing some relaxed regulation and, and some openings. Um, is that, you know, gentlemen, I mean, something that you, you see coming anytime soon? I mean, is it something that we've been working towards? I mean, what are your thoughts on a regulatory piece? And I'll just throw it out to... We're, we're, we've been working um, in the region. Uh, there's a few different regulatory um, advisors. Uh, some of them allow it, and uh, some of them are working on uh, getting operations going, and that's kind of something we're, we're trying to push along, so... Do you see a lot of progress? I mean, is there, is there some pushback? I mean, what are, what are some of the topics? I mean, is it a safety piece? Is it a... What, what are, yeah. What's kind of holding us back? The single engine over water restriction, we talked a little bit about it yesterday. Um, we struggle with that there between Florida and the Bahamas as well, that with the, um, without floats on board, you know, you got to climb the, within gliding distance of land. And again, those regulations are built around old piston technology. And the new PT6 engine, which is, well, you know, the 140 especially, but the PT6 is an extremely reliable engine. They use it for pipelines and what there's a thousand different uses for that engine, and they run and run and run, and it would be good, I think, for the regulators to take a look at reliability statistics and take a look at changing that regulation, because I think that's the biggest um, obstacle to the caravan being a, a great airplane to operate in the Caribbean, yeah. is and that single engine water. And real quick, we talked about this yesterday, too, you know, the Navy, which is a, a giant behemoth of a bureaucracy, you know, recently made that change where you were only allowed to fly uh, twin engine jets around the boat, and the Joint Strike Fighter now is a single engine airplane. And even the Navy, which takes years to change their mentality, changed their mentality because of technology. And I think it's important for the regulators to take a look at the statistics and possibly change that. Yeah. And we're working from the factory as well. You know, we've got our legislators and, and folks that are, are uh, that work at the factory, they're working directly with the various governments along with Tropical Aviation to, to make those meetings come about and, and make some progress there. Um, I think that once we can move, move past that, it certainly is going to open up uh, the tourism and just the economics down here for the uh, for the transport. You know, my, my first time down here, you know, I'm really realizing it. I mean, I've 
you know, was sitting out the other night and, you know, saw, saw the island of Saba out there, never even knew it existed. And so started Googling it and found, you know, all these various things you can go do. And now I'm excited to, you know, to go over and, and see it. And you've got a ferry, you've, you've got a couple airplane options. So for, for myself, and, and it, it, re, it was really resonating yesterday when they talked about, you know, the tourism piece. I'm, I'm, you know, busy guy, I do a lot of traveling and my vacation planning is pop-up stuff when I can get a few days off. And to be able to have that easy access, that certainly is something that I I like to work towards. So, um, Bertram, regarding you know the regulations and and the things that you see in your operation, um, you know how are you seeing how that affects uh, what you're doing? Well, uh, we are under the EASA regulation, and one of the things in the Caribbean that you have so many different. Um, authorities uh, acting all together. When it comes to France and EASA, they've been quite open about the overwater part of it. Uh, the main obstacle that we had was more for the single engine IMC. As you know, in Canada and in the US, it's been approved for many, many years. It's only this year in March that the European Commission finally approved a legis legislation that will come into force uh, fully. We've been approved to do it by a derogation since 2012, and it's been a long fight. Um, even within Europe, all the countries were not agree on that, but definitely I would back up what you just said. It's really about technology. I mean, when you look at the caravan now with the G1000, all the data and information that is readily available to the pilot, and plus the engine trend monitoring, it's a very, very, I think that's probably was the key to move toward that. They made several safety study and they really proved that it's not unsafe, uh, given that you operate properly, uh, do proper training and have really good standard operating procedures. So even the, the PT-6 is basically a very, very reliable engine, but with the engine trend monitoring where you exactly know what happens, and, I mean, a pilot cannot hide anything he did wrong. Uh, one month ago, we had a pilot going uh, over torque, and uh, we had all the data available, how much he went over it, how long he did, so we could technically uh, speak to the factory, to the Pratt & Whitney, and say, okay, you need to do this, this, inspect this, and period, the thing is over. Uh, that was not the case before. You could have such an event, and it could go unknown. So nowadays, with the technology, yeah, it's it's a real plus for safe operation. All right, good, good. Modern version of the 402C. You know, we get that a lot when we're at word shows, and and there's various aircraft out there that that folks really enjoy, and and they've got a lot of history and lineage too. The challenge, I think, is the manufacturing piece and the cost associated with with bringing the tooling back and working on those airplanes. I mean, you know, the reality is, is right now a new Baron is about a 1.4 million dollar airplane. Um, a new Bonanza is 800,000, and there's just no way around that. So, you know, an airplane like that, if I had said, well, would you pay $2 million for it? <clears throat> Probably not. So that's, that's the challenge out there. We, we work with the, the airplanes that we've got coming down the production line. So, um, you know, we look at options, and we certainly we try to address the market. I think the Cessna Denali is probably one of those airplanes out there that, you know, we listen to in the market. It's long overdue um, to have a single engine turboprop and, and compete in that market. Um, so we're excited about that and we're moving towards that. Now I think the caravans is a natural evolution. I have, let's say a hundred different, we'll call them chieftains, Navajos and 402s, Bs and Cs, I ensure, mm -hmm. over a hundred. Yep. At some point, they're gonna have to- Make a change. Make a change. Cape Air, everybody else. Well, you know, where are they going and when is that gonna happen it remains to be seen, but. Yep, yep. I find it sad that it would cost two million to produce it. To, at that point, they might as well get a caravan. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, it's. There's airframes out there that that I just think are fantastic, and they they were they were incredible operators. And you know, we still support the products, and and we still will make sure that we're going to keep the airplanes in the air. But they'll they will come a point where those airframes are just expired. They're done. So. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, speaking to um, uh, the uh, single engine over water, I think you're speaking to the choir here with, we're all on the same page with that. And it's uh, analogous to uh, um, when they had to change the rule for multi-engines over water 
years ago, you couldn't fly twin engine airplanes on, uh, on ETOPS extended range over water operations. Uh, do you think that Textron could reach out to all the operators and collectively approach the regulators on this from a unified front? I think that would be something that would, you could take back to Wichita, um, that if they would reach out to all these operators that are here, whether it be Tropic or St. Bart's or Shoreline Aviation, maybe collectively we could, and all the operators in the U.S., um, to help forge, uh, to look at the regulation, because you're not going to do it, we're not going to do it us, ourselves. Right. You know? <clears throat> right. So I think uh, I think there, somebody in Wichita reaching out to everybody would help um, forge ahead for this to change the regulation, because we all, I think we all agree that it's owners. Sure, sure. And it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've got, uh, we just had a, um, uh, an operators conference in Wichita. Um, and what we do is we, we will do that with towards product lines and we're developing those towards uh, the turboprop market as well. So I think that if we can, um, you know, unify, reach out, and then have some of these various conferences from the factory side to address these things. I, that's certainly something that, that I'd love to love to kind of put together and, and uh, make sure that we show that presence from the factory. So, sir. Thanks. Um, Bertrand mentioned the, the European rule having just changed to allow single engine turbine, and it may well pay uh, people to take a look at the construction of the European rule. Uh, it's not great um, in terms of how it works, but it does allow a risk period um, where you can be outside a gliding distance from a, a suitable landing point. And it does also, I think, incorporate the ability to do a separate risk assessment and argue for a longer period of time. The, the standard period is 15 minutes, which won't be enough, I guess, to get you across to the Bahamas. Uh, but if you, it does allow a, a discrete risk assessment, so now that's in the EASA rule, you may well find you could leverage that back towards the FAA. Um, yeah, I'm, there's certainly some positive thing in the European rule. As you explained exactly, you have to do a, a first route analysis, and if you have that 15-minute risk period that is deemed acceptable. Now, when they went into the notice of proposed amendment for that rule, many operators objected, saying, well, 15 minutes, that's great, but that doesn't sound right when you talk about reliability, about chance of having an engine failure per hour. And actually what it could do is drive operators to make a stop in between when they have a flight when they cannot comply with the 15 minutes. And the end result is that you have an added takeoff and landing, and that's where the airplane is the most exposed. So you're actually taking more risk by doing that unnecessary stop. So they move toward that uh, risk-based analysis which is uh, good. It's, um, if I can make a quick parallel with the performance-based navigation, we come now to a point where we're telling you, okay, we want you to have that uh, level of precision. It doesn't really matter how you do it, whether you use IRS, DME, DME, or GN, GPS, we want that level of precision. It's kind of the same mentality that they put into that um, risk analysis. We want you to have a level of safety given in numbers in terms of event per million hours. Now, it is your job to, based on the uh, engine reliability uh, from the manufacturer, and you do a, an analysis of the flight um, by segmenting it in many pieces, and for each eight segment, you uh, define uh, what are the chances of an unsuccessful force landing. And you can mitigate that uh, risk by having a area designated where you can land, or by giving some um, higher uh, weather condition. Um, if you take off uh, with a 800 meters visibility and overcast at 300 feet, if you have an engine fuel at 500 feet, you're in bad position. But if you put your uh, minimums at 1,500 feet like we did, then your chances are much higher. So by adjusting all these data, then you get to a real risk based on a specific flight and a specific route. So it is a lot of numbers, and it's, but the philosophy behind it, I think, goes in the right direction. Makes sense.
have another question for Bertram. I was listening to your statistics, and in 11,000 hours, you've had 50,000 cycles. That's phenomenal. I know I, the TBO, I believe, is at 3,600 hours on a, on a PT6, uh, that model. Can you get the 3,600 hours? I mean, because I know it was never designed to do that many cycles with anticipated 3,600 hours, or do you have to overhaul prior to that? Um, the short answer is that we don't get to 3,600 hours because we do have an agreement with Pratt & Whitney with sort of a program with exchange. But yeah, we went to that program because we click quickly did the math uh, by doing four or five cycles an hour. There are some parts in the PT6 that you will uh, life limited before that. So that's why we, we changed them before 3,600. How many hours do you now Get. Sorry? How many hours do you get before you have to overhaul? Well, we change them at, at HSI, at uh, okay. 1800. Two. Question? Um, well, the, one of the problem, I think, with the uh, single engine mentality is that you will have, um, as Bertrand was saying, the European might have really studied the case and uh, tried to give um, fair replies to the requests. Uh, probably this would be as well the um, FAA position. The problem within the Caribbean, within the Eastern Caribbean, is that um, in the past we don't have seen the regulators, um, mainly ECHA, uh, really willing to sit down and study and talk with operators. Um, and that not only for single engine, for, for many other topics. Um, so in my opinion, it's more a question of trying to lobby and to push and to explain to ECHA and to many other uh, civil aviation uh, authorities why the others do agree to discuss and what is the gain for everybody um, ECHA is, is, is um, undermanned. Um, ECHA does not have a big budget. Uh, but as crazy as it can appear, ECHA would like to, um, to, to certify an aircraft, even if it has been certified in Europe and in the United States. Right. So until this mentality can change. I, I don't see um, any real move with these small civil aviation authorities uh, who need to, to understand that there is a common interest. Well, and that's, that's good input. I mean, from a, from a factory perspective, that, you know, that allows me to take that back and, and work, towards, work towards those things, because I, I think that it's, it needs to be a focused, concentrated effort, um, especially from the factory side. So I'll definitely take that, uh, take that back with me. So um, we've got, I mean, just a couple of minutes left here. I was going to cover some more of the products, um, but uh, we, I think we've had some good discussions, some good topics you know, related to what we're working towards. Um, anybody on the panel have any kind of final comments or thoughts? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the caravan, and um, I'd love to see Textron take the lead on, on lobbying, maybe working with ECHA, working with ESA, working with the FAA, because there really right now there isn't any other aircraft that can do what that aircraft does on the market. Yeah. And to give you an idea of why we, we selected it, um, in a typical day, or let's just say in a typical month, we have a wheeled caravan that we're flying people back and forth between you know, Florida and some island in the Bahamas. Then we find out that, you know, we need another seaplane for an operation, so we send it to Whip Air, we put floats on it, and now it's running as a seaplane. And then we say, oh gosh, we have a cargo run that we need to do, so we pull the seats out, throw cargo in it, and fly it direct to a property that needs cargo delivered last minute. And then, the, and then that afternoon, we get a billionaire who calls us up and says, hey, I want to fly to my private island, so that we bring it back to the hangar, throw seats in it, and uh, in a club configuration and fly him and his family back to his private island. And there's really, and, and by the way, it's comfortable air condition and everything else. So there's no aircraft that can do what that aircraft does. Mm -hmm. So we just need to work together to, to pave the way to be able to operate that aircraft here. Good. Good. Thank you. 
Any other questions from the group? Robbie? Well, I mean, the Denali is, I mean, if we got a couple minutes here, Bert, I don't want to hold this up, Damien. We're good. Um, so the Cessna Denali is exciting. Um, it's it's something that's been a long time coming for, for Textron Aviation. Uh, the aircraft's been under development now for about 18 months. Uh, we're expecting first flight next year, uh, certification, and then deliveries uh, should begin in late uh, 2019 into 2020. Um, when our engineers set out to build this aircraft, they they made sure that every parameter from a competitor standpoint would be exceeded. Um, this aircraft is going to be a uh, uh, about a 285 knot airplane. Uh, we're going to do 310. Uh, the pressurization differential is going to be incredible. It's going to be a very comfortable ride, uh, you know, for our customers. Every cargo dimension of the door, and I've seen the mock-up out in out in Wichita. Uh, we should have the, some of the first airframes getting put together. Um, every cargo dimension is several inches uh, bigger than you know the other well-known single-engine airplane out there. Uh, so we're excited. Uh, it's it's going to be a good product. I think it's something that could certainly be incorporated in the islands as well. Um, you know, once we move past some of the, the single engine issues. Um, but from a performance standpoint, I mean, it's it's going to be all that. We're really excited. And, and we can certainly see uh, operators, you know, potentially moving towards that aircraft as well for, for longer range and longer missions. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting yesterday to see the slide where it, it showed St. Martin and, and how all the other islands connect and the distances. And then the airplane sales guy kicks in and says, oh, yeah, this our aircraft can do this. Our other model could do this. But the Denali seems like a product that's really going to fit the niche. So we're, we're excited about it. The airplane's around a $4.5 million airplane, Robbie. Um, so it certainly is going to be more competitive than a lot of the, the multi-engine aircraft out there. Um, when we do airplanes, you know, we certainly try to make them as economical as possible. I mean, I think Cessna has always been known as the really fantastic Ford Chevy Buick. You know, we, we try to price it to where it's, um, you know, we can continue to, to move forward, and but we, we can also provide a product in the marketplace that, that our customers can utilize. Absolutely. 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 So we're, we're excited. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It's not. It's metal. It's it, we're using some some newer technology. So, from the jet side, you know, Matt's CJ3 and, and all that. Uh, the airplane we use more of a metal bonding process now, um, and it's really interesting to see that process out in Wichita and, and you know see some of the the engineering behind that. So it'll, it'll be an all metal construction, uh, but with some of the metal bonding technology. So, sir. Yeah, this is more tourism-oriented question than sure. an operational question to Rob. Yep. Uh, Rob, yesterday, correct me if I'm wrong, I heard you mention that if the area is rough, the seas are rough, you won't uh, land, uh, you won't be able to land. Does this limit you? Uh, does this limit your choice in destination within the Caribbean? And if so, have you selected areas already by doing research of where these uh, limited areas would be, uh, limited destinations would be? Um, it, it does limit it sub, somewhat. Okay. We look for, obviously, protected areas. If we know we're going to have regular flights to, a, to an area, we'll, we'll identify an area at the island that we deem will have the highest probability of success. A good example of this is in the Bahamas. You know, when we select a new location, we work you know, both with the government and with the local properties to figure out the right location. And um, we've seen locations that you know the original seaplane landing area was I would say we had a 75% success rate, and by moving the location a few hundred yards, you know, based on our input, now we've gone up to a 98% mission completion rate. So, so there are, I think, um, challenges to identifying that location, and there's some areas in the Caribbean that most likely we wouldn't be able to get into. Um, however, I know, Richard, I'm gonna call on you here for a second. You've been down here for a while with Shoreline, and you probably have more experience at the individual locations that you've been looking at, correct? It really needs to be a spot that's protected, has enough, um, <clears throat> we're affected by wind and wave. Um, and, um, and the period of wave, whether it comes in. So we look at places that uh, if we're gonna operate on a regular basis that are, that are protected. So um, we know how much distance we need, we know, uh, whether or not there's uh, a boating uh, and shipping lanes that we have to take into account. So 
Uh, we, on one of our areas that we went through with the BVIAA um, and certified a uh, water aerodrome in North Sound, uh, we, knock on wood, we've been operating there 100% of the time. We have not missed a trip in five years. So uh, with some due diligence and, um, you know, John's the pro on this. He's, he's the man to talk to. You want this? Tell me, uh, one of the things that, that you have to do in, in, in assessing a water area is essentially making the same kind of, a, of an assessment as you would as an airport designer would. You have, to, you have to look at your runway lengths, you have to look at obstructions, which might be coral heads or, or shoals or something like that. And, and you have to look at your prevailing wind directions, just as you would if you're designing an airport. And so when we're asked to go to a new place, the first thing we do is, is look at, at where the protected water is, what kind of space we have. Another issue is uh, uh, being able to uh, operate with the surrounding terrain in the Caribbean. Some of the mountain, some of the uh, the, uh, the islands have mountainous terrain very close to the water. So you have to go ahead and, and look at your departure paths and your glide slopes in and everything like that. That's that's part of an, of an assessment process that we do for any landing area, whether it's a, it's going to be a landing area that's going to be used on a daily basis or on a one-off, you know, request to meet a yacht or to go to a, a, a private island or something like that. So it's, it's not, I mean, we don't just go out there and, and eyeball it. I mean, it's a lot of work goes into that assessment. Yeah. I think, I think the important point, though, is that, you know, as, as we saw with eight years in the Bahamas and, and with John's seen down here for, for many, many years, um, the, I would say the the, the local resorts and the governments should kind of defer to the seaplane operators to make an assessment. Uh, a lot of times in the Bahamas, we, we get a request, can you, we want you to land at our property, you know, we want to bring people right direct to my beach. And we look at the beach and we say, look, there's coral, there's waves coming in, and we'll say, hey, what about, let's move down the beach about 300 yards or maybe on the back side of your property in the lagoon, and it'll make more sense. And as long as you give the, the operators leeway and, and empower them to you know, assess the area properly, uh, we'd have a much higher chance of success than many different islands. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, in terms of the seaplane operations for us in the BVA, to me one of the biggest constraints that we have is any seaplane operation that we have, we have to certify that particular place. Um, certification involves surveys, it involves the provision of fire. So um, in terms of operations in the BVI, the BVI has the potential to, to, to have many places. We have Jazz Van Dyke, we have high-end resorts that seaplanes can go into. Um, from my personal opinion, I think it would be a good idea for us to have that kind of business in Tortola. But one of the constraints that we have is the regulatory mm -hmm. um, bodies asking us to put a lot of conditions in place to make such um, operations feasible. And I think the guys from Shoreline could speak to this, because they see the kind of headache that we had to go through to certify um, the Gun Creek area. Um, one of the problems we have is they require us to put three guys in a fireboat. They require us to have a fireboat of a certain size to take stretchers, and um, they want us to have a certain amount of foam. And um, while it's all nice and good for us, it's very costly, and then we have to now pass the cost onto the operator. Um, one of the things that would be good for us is if our tourism board could understand the, 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 the benefits of what the seaplane operators actually bring to the territory. Um, since these guys have been operating, the bitter end area has transformed. The ability to be able to jump on an aircraft from St. Thomas and land at your resort has been has been something that has blown them out of the water in Tartola. And um, a lot of the operators now, uh, a lot of the businesses now are even willing to come on board with us to assist with, with us getting a boat and a vessel. But I just think we need to be able to coordinate it. So in the same vein of our conversation yesterday, um, I think that's something if we can come together as operators and approach the regulator on these issues, it would be good. But in addition to that, you guys who are making the aircraft, um, because one of the issues we have to also is the same concept of the single engine and the safe gliding distance. So if you guys could come together with the regulator and as um, Rob rightfully say, show them that the technology that we have can in fact do this for 
the issue we have right now, FedEx and DHL require a special permit to operate out of Turtle at night because of the IMC and not having the ability to be able to um, fly at night because of IMC and safe gliding distances. So these are constraints that, I mean, if we can come together and go to the industry and show them that we can actually do what we say we can do, we'll be in a better position and it'll benefit both us um, as a territory and I guess it'll benefit you as a manufacturer and allow your aircraft to be sold. Because the biggest constraints in the Caribbean that we have is a lot of the regulatory rules and regulations that are in place are very old. And um, to get these entities to sit together is difficult. The gentleman alluded to ECHA. ECHA is not going to move until ECHA sees some other regulatory body moving in that direction. So I think someone has to pioneer it. And if we can get that done, I think we'll go far. Um, We'll go a far distance. That's good. No, I appreciate that feedback because it's, you know, these are things that, that you know, being out in the market and, and really understanding, and I'm certainly going to take this back to the factory and, and kind of move move towards those steps. And that's kind of what I do from a factory perspective is is work towards these pieces um, to try to make it a smoother transition and, and get things moving for, for our distributors that, that sell our airplanes. So we got some work to do. Yeah, we got some work to do. I'm probably going to be unpopular for saying this, but I actually think regulators are very reasonable people. And I think, if, seriously, and I think if we work together, I think if we work together, great points. You know, Richard, you're, you're laughing back there, but I think we can, uh, I'm a very patient man and I've got a lot of years ahead of me to do this. Um, so I think we could work together and I think show them that, you know, a lot of the regulations are built around fear. Yeah. And if we could take that fear away and show them statistically, that you know you don't need three guys in a fireboat every time a seaplane lands because we do it all over the United States without concern. And here's why, and here's how we do it, and here's how we recommend that you adjust this regulation to say, okay, as long as you're doing A, B, C, D, and E, this should be allowed. Perhaps we could work together on that. So, so Richard, I'm gonna call you later, and we're gonna, okay. gonna do some paperwork. All right. So. <laughs> Um, any further questions? I, I appreciate your time, guys. I think this was a great open discussion. You know, we it, and the discussions usually change as we go, and, and so I think this has been really good. Um, certainly, I'm available. Matt's available for questions on any of our other products. Um, as I said, we've got the CJ3 out at the airport. Love to have you come out and take a look at that airplane, and you know, Matt can cover the, the technical piece of that and, and how it can apply down here in the territory as well. Um, any questions on any of the other aircraft, you know, please let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help, and, and I'm looking forward to, to meeting more folks this week. It's been a great week so far.